Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, uh, Chicago's digital startup hub. We have a great uh, lineup tonight. We have Justin Howard, the founder of uh, Sprout Social. Justin, thanks for being here. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. So uh, those of you who know Sprout Social know uh, it's an exciting, uh, what an exciting company it is. I was talking to someone uh, coming in and they said, Tell them we love his products. Everywhere I've gone, they you hear that from people. But for those who don't know, what how would you best describe what Sprout Sprout is? Yeah, so Sprout's a social media management software platform that uh, helps businesses more effectively manage their social. Um, so we have about fifteen thousand, a little over fifteen thousand customers around the world. It's a SaaS SaaS cloud business software type yep. thing. Uh, who rely on our product to manage their uh, Twitter and Facebook and, and Google Plus and LinkedIn and their social channels to get more connected to their customers. Um, and you said you have 15,000 businesses on it. Yeah. And, and uh, what kind of scale? How many in the U.S., beyond? Uh, yeah, so we're, um, our customers are in um, over 100 countries now. Um, we uh, certainly have a, a, a large number of U.S. customers. I think 35% of our business is international. Wow. Um, just last week, we actually launched our first international market in, in a localized fashion. So Latin America um, with Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese, that's our first non-English offering, um, which we just launched last week. Oh, that's cool. I look forward to getting into it. But you're not a native Chicagoan. You grew up in um, Northern California. Yep. And uh, as I was preparing for this, I understand that you were, uh, part of what you're doing is you're always selling something. Yeah. And, uh, but talk about it. Did, you know, did you, were there things that people saw you growing up, they'd say, yeah, I knew he'd end up doing something interesting in technology or innovation. Yeah, what, yeah. what kind of, when did these things first start to show in, uh, in your early life? So, um, I, I mean, I think uh, the way entrepreneurs are wired, you've, you've always got ideas and you're trying different things, but um, getting involved with technology early started with me. Um, uh, actually, I would gotten a, a dirt bike. I lived in rural California, a very small town. I would gotten a, a, a dirt bike as a, as a, I think, a birthday present. Got to be a popular promptly. thing in rural California. Yeah, I mean, it was great, but I promptly traded that for a, a Commodore computer. Um, and started teaching myself how to how to program and not as cool, not as nearly as cool. <laughs> um, although I was uh, too young then to to probably care what cool was, but so you know I taught myself how to program and and um, uh, just started getting really infatuated with technology. Started building computers and, and this was back when uh, it was just XTs, very simple computers. But um, so this is like eighties, nine, early nineties. Yeah, so uh, late eighties. Late eighties. Yeah. So this was uh, you know this is before. So many things happen. So you're, you're doing this, and, and what, what got you excited about it? What, what intrigued you so much? Um, it, it, it's tough to say, but I think as a curious person, technology has so much to offer, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so many unknowns, and there's so many things that you can manipulate technology to make it do, and things that have never been done before. So I think just the curiosity of, of um, being fascinated with being able to build something from scratch and make a computer do things that it wasn't intended to do, I think was always really attractive and appealing. Well, that's cool. Can you hear us in back, by the way? Great. Cool. Um, okay, so you might want to talk a little bit louder for someone back there. All right, okay. so you um, you go ahead and get your first job, and you yep. marry two things that you seem to like doing as a youth. You love technology, and you were selling things and yeah, yeah. different things as you grew up as a kind of young entrepreneur. Um, talk about that job, how you chose it. What yeah. that 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 transition into the into the workforce? Yeah. So um, actually, one of my first jobs was um, selling cellular phones. It was just an after school job that um, you know I was I, I understood the technology and and was uh, uh, at least mediocre with dealing with people. Um, so I, I got involved in that and then um, uh, transition after school. I went uh, to work for a software training company. Um, it was actually in Southern California. So um, moved there, started working for that organization just as. You know, being passionate about technology, and uh, I was working with companies, helping them. And is this is this New Horizons? Yeah, New Horizons. New Horizons. Company. So, what did they do? So, a global brand. Um, they were a publicly traded company, but it's basically um, just a global organization that has classroom training for different software products. So, I would help large organizations figure out their. Like what was the what was like the most common product that someone might have experienced if they experienced New Horizons back in the day? Of um, so, if you got like Cisco certified, or if you got an MCSE. Okay. Um, some of these uh, technology vendor certifications that would Got go it. through us. Okay, so so they they're in this business. They're out selling the world. On, it says like you're selling companies, or you're selling. Yeah, to companies. Okay. So if they needed to roll out new technology, we were the training arm of that. Got it. Yep. Okay. 
So you go to work for them. What do they hire you to do? As a, uh, just a sales new guy. guy. Yeah, so, just what, sales guy. so what are you selling? What I think the first through? thing I was selling, when I, the day I started, they had me calling people, uh, existing customers, asking if they wanted to buy CD-ROMs with training programs on them. And then throughout the years, it, it became... Uh, uh, CD-ROMs. Now, see, that is yeah, yeah. a blast from the past. Very Everybody, well, right? who remembers CD-ROMs? Anybody remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so that's how I started, and then uh, you know got better and better, and All right, eventually. So let's, was... let's 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 go back. So you're a young guy, you've sort of sold phones on the, is it, you know, when you were in school and done different things, but now this is for real. This is your job. This is how you're going to pay your mortgage, pay your rent, you know, yeah. the whole deal. Um, you go out to sell this training. You don't know anything about these companies. I mean, you, it's like you worked for one of them before, yep. right? So. So how did it go when you first started? What did you learn when you went out there pounding the pavement? Yeah, I mean, what was it like? Uh, I mean, you learn pretty quickly that you don't know anything, right? And that's humbling and humiliating, and you learn quickly uh, what it is that you need to do to make a difference for these people who are buying whatever it is they're buying from you. Do you think you knew that before you first called or after you first called? Is it, do you learn it once you start calling on people and you go, God, yeah, I know less than I, I think, do? I think, you know, you're riding on the ego the first couple of calls, and then after a while you realize you really don't know. And then uh, it, then you figure out what you have to do to be successful and, and be a little more scrappy about it. So how do you, how do you figure that out? Because it's... You can do things wrong, but process of elimination takes a long time to not necessarily yeah, yeah. randomly get to what's right. Yeah, I mean, this was a largely commissioned job, so you don't screw up for too long uh, <laughs> when you got to you know, pay bills and, and, and feed yourself. So you, you learn pretty quickly, and just being in it, kind of so, sink or swim. So what were those early lessons you learned? Um, I think that uh, one of the earliest sales lessons that I learned was um, uh, product mastery is probably the most important thing. You can be persuasive. You can you can follow sales methodologies and do those things. But um, if people don't trust that you know more about their problem than they do, um, they're just not going to buy from you. And so I think how'd you how'd you sense. develop that? So because I mean these are obviously you know companies that have uh, fairly sophisticated companies. Yeah. So how'd you get how'd you get smart on their smarter on what they needed to do than they were? Just soaked up everything I could. Reading same thing that got me into technology in the first place. Just curiosity. I wanted to learn everything I could. Um, until the point where you know they could consider me kind of an expert in the field. Interesting. So, so you start selling there. You're at. Um, so you're out there selling. How long did it take before? I know you were very successful there. Ultimately, yeah. how long did it take you to really hit the uh, inflection point and being able to be as productive that level of productivity? Yeah. Selling? I, I think, um, and I've experienced this a few times. I think it takes about three years to really get good at something. Maybe more like five to really master it. So about three years start getting good. Five, you master it. And yeah. And I understand you were the uh, top rep there for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. um, and and that was around the same time I get it, uh, started getting a little disinterested. Was you've kind of mastered it, and it's um, uh, the challenge kind of wears off, and then it was kind of on to the next thing after that. So, and where were you with them? You started in Southern California. Started in Southern California. We opened a new office in Las Vegas. So I moved to Las Vegas on my like 21st birthday. How was living in Las Vegas? Uh, a lot different than you'd think. It was actually a really cool city to live in um, at the time. This was before the housing bust and, and a bunch of that stuff. So um, I had a blast. But it's it's uh, a good transitional place. It's probably not a place you settle down. And then where where did you go after that? Uh, and then after that, so um, uh, met some friends out there who are from Chicago. Uh, they came out here and, and had their wedding here and moved back here. I was in that wedding. That was my first experience with Chicago. And then um, I loved it. It was in June, so <laughs> I loved it. And uh, We bait and switch with that. Yeah, also. yeah. And then I think I moved here like a month later and uh, for, with the same company. There's a, there's a, Hunter was here earlier speaking, and he was, played for the Bears, and there was a joke. If the Northwestern won the Rose Bowl, they uh, recruited the top kid from Hawaii. And they said, they said, why'd you pick Northwestern? He said, it's like Hawaii. There are beaches and water. Yeah. Someone said, have you been there any time besides the summer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we do, it does work. So you come here, you're excited about it, you're a hotshot sales guy. Yeah. Did you move here with New Horizons? Yeah, so I moved here with New Horizons, and then I stayed on with them probably for a couple years. Um, All right, so you're, you're doing well. You're top-ranked national sales guy. You're living the life here. It's beautiful having fun. Yep. It's a great city to be young in. Why change? And what um, you changed to? Yeah, so it, it was just kind of the, the, the challenge after a while. It was... Um, what year is this? Uh, good question. So 2003. It's probably about 2007. Okay. Um, and uh, wanted to do something different. Just you get the itch. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have experienced that and, and you want to Start a, a new challenge. company next week, so yeah, I get the yeah, itch. Yeah. Um, so I actually uh, left, left that job, um, had a probably a six-month stint at uh, starting a new company of my own, hmm. which... Um, 
I didn't know enough yet. Um, I wanted to start something. It wasn't an idea that I necessarily, um, it was still in the training space. So it's kind of like more of the same. I didn't have the fire for it that I probably needed to get it off the ground. Hmm. Um, and so that lasted for a little while. And then I um, ended up connecting with a company called Learn.com, which is enterprise software. Uh, and uh, really liked the team there. And, and uh, so that's, that's where I was following that and just before starting Sprout. Got it. So um, and talk about just a minute about your first time. I mean, you got out six months is a, is a pretty quick learning. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what were, the, what were the most important things you think you learned from kind of a false start as an entrepreneur um, that, that helped you as, when you did it, you know, yeah. so successfully? Um, so similar to um, kind of when you get started with sales was um, I, I, I was carrying a lot of ego out of this previous job. I was doing very well and, and could sell, you know, uh, could be very successful in that, in that role. And I took that ego into this, starting this new thing, and just totally overestimated, you know, my, my ability to start something from scratch. Right. Yeah. Um, and how, what, what allowed you to get out so quickly? I, I, I didn't have a lot of means at the time. And uh, if, if, but, if but I could be guys, A lot of guys will work a job and do it on the side because they don't want to say that yeah. they're wrong. You, you obviously learned to cut bait. Yeah, yeah. At the, at the time, it was just, um, it, it didn't look like it was going to go anywhere for a while. And I could, I could... Um, uh, sort of uh, keep going at it and, and trying it, or I could um, learn more, and which was why the next opportunity was so perfect because they were a software company. They were a little smaller than Sprout is now, but um, I felt like I could learn a lot, and I realized trying this thing that I didn't know enough yet. Got it. Yeah. Um, so you go work for Learn, you said about two, three years? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was three, three, four. Three years. So one of the things we talk about at Chicago Founder Stories is uh, founder market fit, and there's a couple parts to yours that I think are really interesting. And so I just wanted to explore a little bit um, how your experience, both um, as a salesperson at Learn.com and then in helping Learn.com develop certain skills, kind of led to Sprout. So take yep. us through that story of not just what you were doing, but how you got the idea for the need to yeah. sort of start working with social media as a sure. salesperson. So, um one of the really cool things about, about Learn was it was the first time I was actually uh, involved in, in selling software. Um, we were doing training before, and, and this was my first exposure to uh, a product team, to building against uh, requirements of these large enterprise corporations and figuring out how product marketing worked and all these sorts of things. So um, that gave me a lot of exposure to a lot of the things that we're dealing with now. Um, along the way, I was, um, I've always been sort of a, a, a technology geek, right? So along the way, I would, I would tinker with things and find ways that I could be more effective at selling through technology, um, using things like LinkedIn and blogs and, and, and these different ways that I could leverage technology to do my job better. And as a result, the company kind of tapped me to help develop materials to help the other sales reps understand how they could use technology, um, how they could use it to be more effective. And that uh, kind of research and process uh, was when I started to figure out that there was something really interesting about what Facebook and Twitter um, and LinkedIn could do for the uh, brand and consumer relationship. And through that research, discovered kind of this gap in the market, and that's where the, the idea from Sprout really came from. I wanted to use social to do these things. Uh, the tools didn't yet exist. It was all uh, geared toward the individual. So what, what was the workaround? How did you make it work before, back then? Um, I, Again, being a sponge, learning as much as I could, um, probably going to a, an extent that most people wouldn't. So I, I did it the hard way, and we knew that there was probably an easier way to do it. Um, all right, so you're, you're using social media, and was it helpful to you in, um, with your customers? Uh, at, at Learn? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, how it was... was it, how was it, I guess, that the other people at Learn started wanting to learn more yeah. about this themselves. So the first thing was I, I put out, we were selling learning management software, um, uh, which is uh, something that big organizations use to deploy talent management and those sorts of things. Um, I put out a blog post on what you should put in your RFP if you're buying learning management software. Certainly entirely catered toward the things that we did. Um, but I did it just as an individual, and I said, here's my credentials, and here's the things that you should be looking for. And I started getting heads of, uh, organizational development from these large companies hmm. commenting on this blog post asking me to get in touch they wanted to talk so by putting this this was like the earliest form of content marketing people would start approaching me and then I'd be getting deals from other people's territory um, so that everyone wanted to figure out how can they leverage some of these things oh interesting yeah and what were the most successful strategies back at that point at that point um, 
know, it was it was pretty limited to. I think LinkedIn was was pretty popular at the time for what we were trying to do. Um, blogs. Uh, that was about it. So Twitter hadn't really caught on yet. In fact, I don't even think I knew about it at that point um, until I started doing this research. And then Facebook was just a personal tool. So it, it was pretty much LinkedIn at that point. Got it. So you're in the early stages of, uh, of you know of using this and of social media emerging as a business tool. Yeah. So given that, what what made it the right time to start the company? Uh, so identified this problem. Um, the key to it all was uh, I had the right people around me at that time. Um, my co-founder, Aaron Rankin, our, one of our other co-founders, uh, Gilbert Lahr and, and Peter Song, um, we were all excited about the same idea at the same time. Um, we started building against this product in our spare time. So Sprout. So, so, so back up, because this is an interesting story how your sort of your team came together. Yeah, so, yeah. So walk us through it. So you're, you're, you're the sales rep using this very successfully, blogs and different things. And I think at one point, didn't you train some of your um, other people in the company on yep. how to do this? Yeah, yeah. So you're kind of the in-house expert trying to do this. And uh, and then who was the first person you were kind of tossing the idea about, hey, maybe I shouldn't just be an in-house expert. Yeah. Maybe we should go do this for other companies. Yeah, so my roommate. Uh, okay. My roommate at the time was Gil. He's one of our co-founders now at Sprout. Um, and we started just conceptualizing what we thought this, what, what the solution looked like to this problem that I was having in, you know, uh, down the hall on my day job. And what was Gil doing at the time? Uh, he was doing design work for a company called Freeman, which does environmental uh -huh. design, trade shows, things yep. like that. So he was just doing uh, 3D and graphic design. So he's a designer. So your roommate's a designer. You guys are tossing this around at yep. night. Yep. And what makes it go from just a conversation between a couple of roommates into yeah. like moving to that next yeah. level? So uh, my wife, uh, girlfriend at the time, now wife, uh, uh, was friends with our other co-founder, uh, Aaron Rankin's wife. We went on a double date. This was around the time that Gil and I are throwing around this idea. Um, we went to, um, I don't remember where it was now, but uh, we were just having drinks and talking about what we did. And um, this topic came up of this idea that we had. And Aaron um, let me know that he was an engineer and uh, a pretty good one. Uh, I remember him saying it that way. Uh, <laughs> and um, so we just started talking about this idea and we got kind of energized. And then we met either the following day or a couple days later um, to hammer out if we wanted to work on this together. And then that ended up being the kind of the, the, the core crew. Hmm. So the three of you are tossing this idea around and you start working on the side, right? Yep. So how long were you working on the side before you had a product? So something you could go get in front of for potential customers? Yeah, so we were probably working on it for three or four months before we demoed it to anybody. Um, we were working on it for probably six months before we opened up. Uh, it was just a beta at the time. And that was around the time Twitter kind of caught on to what we were doing. And, um, so before we go, so who, who, yeah. how do you decide who the first person to show your product to is? I think we just tweeted about it um, and saw who showed up. Huh. Uh, our very first customer was the State Bar of Texas. We certainly don't know anyone there. Um, so it was just a, uh, uh, I think we put it out on Twitter and, and, and they came. Interesting. How yeah. many followers did you have on Twitter at the time? Couldn't have been more than a couple hundred. I mean, I'm, I'm, wow. I'm not that charming on Twitter, so I don't think it was many. Wow. So you, um, interesting. And Let's go to, we like to talk a lot about product market fit here as yeah. well. So clearly you, you understood it because you'd live with the problem and you were thinking about how to do this. But, um, you know, one of the interesting things about product market fit is we all think we have it all figured out before we get out there. Yeah. And then we learn a lot where the lean startup tactics come from. Yep. Um, just go back before you'd figured it all out. When you yeah. just first had that, when you showed shown thing the State Bar of Texas, what was your hypothesis, what was your belief about what the product, who it ought to be targeting, and yep. what it needed to do. And then let's talk a little bit about what you learned. Yeah. So um, the initial thought was, the initial idea was that social is this new kind of confusing thing to a lot of businesses out there. Um, they weren't staffed for it. It wasn't something that they were used to. So we thought that we were going to make social media um, easier to understand, something that they could be um, just get up and running quickly. They don't have to know all the ins and outs. We can help them make it simpler. Um, and that was the kind of the strategy with the first version of the product. But what we learned very quickly was that uh, who really needed help and the people who really uh, most appreciated what we were doing was a more sophisticated customer. People who were not saying that we don't understand social, it was people who were saying social doesn't do all, do all the things that we need it to do. Hmm. Um, Sprout adds some of that um, functionality. So, so you went from novice users, kind of a, we got to figure this social thing out, yep. don't really know what that means. Um, as a target, and you really 
shifted pretty radically to power users, yep. it sounds like. People are like, hey, we're all in. We just need more horsepower. Yep. Um, how'd you figure that out? So um, we were observing, uh, observing who was using the product and, and, and kind of what parts of it they were using. We had a couple early users. Groupon was a big early user of ours. Um, and a couple other ones like them who, those were the ones we were getting the most feedback from. And they were saying, hey, you know, can you add this? Can you add that? And it was much more on the complex side of things than the, you know, make this easier for us. Got it. So having Groupon as kind of a customer that didn't fit your profile at all. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about how you first connected with them. But yeah. um, it didn't fit your profile at all. I mean, you'd say Groupon at the time, fastest growing company in the country for yeah. sure. Um, hard to say they just fell off the turnip truck on anything. Yeah. Um, so you, you now look at, at Groupon and you see, boy, we could do a lot more for them. Yeah. And then when did you start, at what point did you start saying, hey, let's target more Groupon? Yeah, so um, we spent probably the first year building the first version of our product. Um, during that time, at some point, Groupon came along. Um, we realized that what we ultimately wanted to build and what was going to be the most valuable thing we could build was something very different, uh, more sophisticated. Um, so we launched our first product, and about a week later, we decided that we were going to scratch it entirely and rebuild from the ground up. Um, so we spent the first year on this first one, decided it was no good, and spent another year building the second version, which is ultimately what's in the market today. Okay, great. And somewhere along the way, your tweeting leads you to a meeting at Twitter. Talk about this story. It's really yes. interesting. So, um, I, I, Fairly early on, right? Yeah, this was still back in like the first six months or so, maybe even in, in within the first three or four months. Um, I don't know exactly how, but um, some folks at Twitter came across our website or a blog post or something like that and, and kind of caught wind of what we were doing. Uh, this was when they were still very small. It was probably 30 or 40 people at the time. Uh, and they tweeted at us and said, hey, you know, we'd love to learn more about what you guys are up to. Um, so that was, certainly it's been a critical relationship for us and, and, and a pivotal point. Um, so we went out and met with them and showed them what we were building and they, they, they dug the ideas and asked us a lot of questions and then uh, ended up introducing us to some of their investors, um, some of their earliest investors. And that kind of got the ball rolling toward, you know, we think that there's something viable here. Um, we think there's something bigger than maybe we first, we first set out to build. Hmm. Interesting. So let's talk about the first time you raised money. Yeah. Uh, so you're starting a little bit of traction. Was it 09, 10? Where yeah, so this would have been the beginning of 2010. Beginning of 2010. Yeah. So um, you have some really, your first investors are some of the most accomplished entrepreneurs, not just in Chicago, but in the country. Yep. Uh, with uh, Brad Keywell and Eric Lipkowski at, at LightBank. Talk a little bit about how that match was made. Yeah. Um, so you'll notice a trend here, but um, I was tweeted about um, the fact that Brad and Eric might be getting a fund together. And at this point, we had spent a lot of time out in, in Silicon Valley talking with a lot of investors out there, um, all uh, very nice, but all very clear about the fact that they felt like we could build a better company in, in, in California. And that wasn't interesting to us at the time. So um, heard about this fund that, that Brad and Eric were working on, found their email address, shot them an email that night. Um, and then we uh, met up probably the next day or the, you know, a couple days later. Uh, and that's how we originally got connected with them. Well, uh, before Justin and I had met, I was talking to Brad um, about something else, and I'd heard someone said they might raise a fund, and I said, you know, are you going to raise, do you think you'd raise a fund? And he said, you know, I, I don't like managing other people's money. I love working with, on our own ideas, and I love working with really interesting entrepreneurs. And I said, and he's like, like, do you know Justin and Sprout Social? Like, we've had more, it's been more exciting to work with them, and he talks about that, like, you know, as exciting as the, what they've done with Groupon, and Inner Workings and Echo Global and all those. Yeah, great to hear. Great to hear, yeah. Um, but you, you, one of the questions that came in is about um, you're out in the valley. Yeah. You chose, obviously, you've chosen to build the company here. I think two, yep. two parts to the question. One is, what was your thought on building the company in Chicago versus Silicon Valley back yeah. then? Yeah. And second, you know, do you see continuing to be here? Yep. So um, our reasons for sticking around back then were pretty selfish. It was... Um, I didn't want to move. I had a, a life going here. Um, Aaron had his wife here. Uh, we were from California and um, wasn't, you know, I, uh, I like Chicago at that point. So um, selfishly, we wanted to stay here. Now, it turns out this wasn't foresight that we had back then, but um, I think that the success of Sprout would look very, very different had we, had we gone to California. The fact that we decided to stay here. Now I can tell you all the reasons why building here is, is a much better idea. At the time, it was just kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a lucky state of affairs mm -hmm. that we didn't want to leave. Um, 
so, and what do you what do you think are some of the things that really helped with that? What, so, what made you so successful? What, what made this a better place to build? Yeah, the um, there's a lot of reasons. The uh, probably the primary one is just the um, the talent in the workforce that we have here. Um, not that there isn't talent in Silicon Valley, but um, it's of a, a different variety here. Um, we were able to build a team um, not only more cost effectively. Um, the cost of living is obvi obviously very different. The um, uh, the cost of talent is very different. Um, but also, you know, our, our uh, retention of our employee base has been outstanding. I mean, I couldn't imagine anything like that anywhere else. And um, the ability, especially in a software company that moves quickly, for, for those original employees to still be around and still have that knowledge retained and to be able to, to share that and help us build the culture uh, has been incredible. So there's, there's a cost factor, but I think the talent factor is the biggest. Godard and Abel, who, you know, from the YPO, who's a great um, founder of Big Machines and has yeah. G2 Crowd, he's got a company out there and a company here, and, and he said it costs twice as much to, for an employee out there, because basically it's the cost of housing is sure. so much higher. And he said, and you don't have the same loyalty. Yeah. And so they, they're going to have more jobs here, even at the company that he bought into out that's headquartered there, yeah. than they will here because he feels like you know, they couldn't have built big machines there in the same way because you know, these people just don't stick with things. This, yeah. you know. And, and it's, it's um, really, I think, counterintuitive for us to be uh, a product that, that um, is so tightly integrated with Facebook and, and Twitter and, and LinkedIn and Google and these companies that are all in the valley and for us to do that. 2,000 miles away, um, but it absolutely has been the best decision we could have made. That's great. So people obviously are very interested, Brad and Eric, among the most successful entrepreneurs anywhere. Um, talk about what were some of the benefits, and then we could talk about some of the idiosyncrasies. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the benefits of having two great founder entrepreneurs as investors yeah. early stage? Um, certainly one of the biggest advantages we had is Brad and Eric have been very successful operators. Um, They've built big companies. They have muscle memory on, on doing big things. And when you're starting out small, um, those things can be intimidating. And you may not be ready to make those kind of decisions and those kind of investments. But um, working closely with people like that who had done big things and been successful with it, um, and to kind of boost you up and say, no, it's really, it's all right. You um, think bigger uh, has, has been by far the biggest probably benefit of working with, with operators as investors. Mm -hmm. um, they do think big, that's for they sure. They do. I, uh, um, if anybody read the Forbes or Fortune article magazine on the new company, um, up, um, what do they call it? Up, is it uptake? No. Up. You're close. Anyway, it's it's massive. It's yeah. hard to get your head around. It's yeah, such yeah. a big idea. It's uh, they they definitely are big thinkers, and obviously it's really paid off for you. So, of course, on the other hand, you've got two founders who are used to having their hands on the wheel. Yeah. So how'd you guys navigate the fact that you weren't all driving the ship? Yeah, um, it, there were a lot of uncomfortable conversations. And I think that's true probably with any um, early stage company and their investors, but um, they're very good at what they do. And they have a lot of confidence in their, their decisions and their abilities. Um, I, you may also caught the theme that I've, I carry some ego into things and I felt like we knew what we wanted to build and how we wanted to build it and how we wanted to go to market. So it took a long time of us uh, working together and earning each other's trust and um, that we were, we were both good at, at different sets of things and, and really kind of meshing. But um, it's, it's turned out to be a, a huge blessing. Um, not the right fit for everyone. Not everyone should work with, with operating investors, um, especially ones uh, who have been so close to the, the companies that they've built. Mm -hmm. uh, makes a lot of sense. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, sort of where the growth happens. So you, you get, you're at Groupon, you're working with Groupon, you start to realize this more sophisticated investor, you're building this new platform yep. that brings the future. How does that insight and evolution of the product turn into an inflection point in growth? Yeah. So we spent, as I mentioned, um, you know, we decided to rebuild this product. And this was already a year in. You don't have a lot of time to prove yourself, but we're a year in, we launch a product and we say, hey, we're going to take another year to rebuild it. Uh, we spent that year building what we thought the right product was. We launched it in November of 2011. Um, our growth was, was reasonable up until then. We could, we, if you squinted, you, you could see how it could be a, a really interesting business. Um, the day we launched that new product, though, our, our, our business just took off. I mean, that's, that's where the hockey stick came and in. What was the secret there? Um, so we started building in things like um, collaboration and multi-user capabilities. We started charging more. 
Um, we added, I think Facebook was maybe a new addition at the time. Um, so, but, but more than anything, it was more um, scalable. We could add to it much more efficiently than the old product. We could be a lot more nimble with it. Um, and that just was the secret sauce, fortunately. You know, we didn't necessarily know that that was going to turn the, turn the tides, but it did. Interesting. Well, it's, uh, you know, you, you raised money again in 2011. Yeah. So before or after you'd launched the product? Before. Before. Yeah. Um, talk about the decision to raise money then. Yeah. So um, availability. Uh, <laughs> it was, we, we, like I said, we, we were convinced we had something. We didn't have the final product that we wanted yet. Um, but we met up with, with NEA and Peter Barris and, and Harry Weller from NEA who believed in the same idea and were willing to give us time to, to, to finish out and build the thing that we wanted to build. So um, it was early, but we loved the team and they had a lot of confidence in us and that made it a really easy decision. So you can imagine though it's stressful when you're, you're sitting on all this new investment and then you take another year still to launch the product. Yeah. Um, it's uh, trying times. So, um, so you're... you're uh... You now have the guy, the managing partner of NEA on your team. Yeah. And you haven't even launched a new product yet. You yeah. launched a new product. You haven't raised money since. Yeah. So we did um, kind of a, a, a follow on bridge, same investors, but we raised another $8 million maybe okay. uh, 10 months ago. And how did you make the decision to not go out to market versus have stay with the same investors? Yeah. So with, with the growth curve that you're on, and I think a lot of businesses at their inflection point will face this, we could go out and raise and sell a lot more equity for a lot more money than we needed at the time or we could raise enough to get us by another 12 or 18 months, at which time our, our valuation could be double or, or triple what it was then had we raised. And so it was just a, a, a very um, logical uh, question for us of, what is the company gonna be worth in 12 months? Why sell the equity early? Got it, yeah. makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, you're, you're talking about scaling this company. It's a, it's a company with a lot of, uh, Yep. What's, what are some of the challenges that you ran into? Uh, you got the new platform, which is great, but where, where did the, anytime somebody starts growing like a hockey stick, you know, you feel the bolts start popping some totally. places. So talk about that. Where did you experience the bolts popping? How'd you guys figure out how to hold it together until you could sort of re-engineer it to, to, to take the new normal? Yeah, so uh, along the way, at some point we learned that you can't plan for everything and you can't build for everything. And, and if you embrace kind of this scrappy, we'll figure it out, and we trust the people around us to figure things out, you, you, you actually get, gain a little more momentum at that point. So we, get, we hit this inflection point. We weren't prepared for it. We started getting really cool customers and, and, and with uh, uh, really cool needs. Um, and we just did it piece by piece. We started hiring salespeople to field the calls. We started hiring market, marketing people to bring more through the door um, and just building out the team. But the, um, you know, the roadblocks, I think, are, are pretty typical. A as the team grows... As you start to add people and management, all those things, there's there's people problems that, that develop. From a product perspective, there's you're, when you're moving that fast, you're acquiring technical debt. There's just no way around it. You're going to build things that you're going to have to go back and refactor later. Um, and, and we did all of those things, but we had enough. I think we learned enough during that that slow time, that mm -hmm. first year, on how to be scrappy and do these things that um, it was a lot smoother for us after that. Um, and what do you what do you feel like this could be? I mean, it's incredible growth story, but yeah. it's still fairly early. I yeah. mean, you know, your your launch in two thousand eleven of the new platform isn't even four years old yet. Yep. So, um, what what can this be when it grows up? Yeah. So um, I, I feel like, uh, and I think the team would agree that we're we're really just getting started. So I mentioned that we were English only until a week ago. Um, we've got a lot of markets. There are a lot more social media users outside of the U.S. than there are in it. Um, and uh, so we've got uh, uh, a much broader market that we need to serve. We've got, we launched a new product a couple weeks back um, that is dealing with employee advocacy through social channels that we can not only sell to our existing customers, but is also a standalone product. Um, we're just getting started with figuring out how Sprout can make social a more effective communication channel between brands and consumers. That's gonna mean a lot of different things over time. Today it means primarily Twitter and Facebook and kind of the tool set that we have. Um, but you know, we're in, in maybe the second inning of what this can be, and we're already on a trajectory that's, that's been outstanding. We're super fortunate to have the growth that we've had, um, but it's nowhere near what we, what we think we can do, and um, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's so much potential in this organization. This team is just nuts. That's great. So I want to go through some of the questions um, that have been coming in before we continue with more yeah. of the 
Um, so how do you go about hiring salespeople in the beginning before you had any money? Um, so we didn't actually have to hire any salespeople before we had money. Um, we uh, had raised money by the time we actually put the product on market. Uh, and initially, even then, um, the only way you could buy it is go to the website and put in your credit card. So I don't even think we had, we had um, salespeople yet then. We probably added our first salespeople maybe around the, the end of 2010. And how did, how, did it, how, how did word spread if you didn't have salespeople? Um, just online marketing, blogs, um, we'd buy pay-per-click, um, all the traditional you know, things that you'll do to uh, uh, attract customers. A lot of social media. Um, one of the coolest things Seems about... appropriate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> And one of the coolest things about um, the way that this company was built was that we were using our platform to build itself, um, to attract customers and support those customers and do all those things. And that's a really effective way to have a leg up. Um, it's a really interesting story of product market fit, not only because you, you, you did some of this before your prior life, but, yeah. but you, in fact, used your product to manage your company. So yeah. That's really, uh, it's kind of like what uh, Jason Fried and they did at you know, totally. Basecamp. Yeah. And, and it was, we were building the house as we were living in it and um, uh, learning how to take better care of our customers and what, what functions we needed to do that. Um, so our customers would ask us for things, but we were one step ahead of them because we were already using it. We knew where the pain points were. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what skills would you say are important in becoming an entrepreneur? Um, so I, I don't know that I have you know, the, the, the best perspective on this because I only know me, you know, but the... The things that I think are important, um, or let me tell you what I see that, that often is missing and, 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 there, and, and doesn't lead to a good outcome, which is just um, you have to want to start it because of the problem that you're solving. Um, uh, and, and I'm sure everyone's heard this before, but um, starting a company to start a company um, won't last. And if there's not something that's going to keep you motivated through the really hard times, because there are a ton of them, um, if you're not passionate enough, you won't last through that period. And so I think you've got to be passionate about a problem. You have to have at least learned how to uh, sell something to someone at some point in your life um, or, or work with someone who has. Um, if you can't convince people to join your company, that's the first sales job you have is in recruiting, um, then you're not going to go places and then you need to sell the product and all those sorts of things. So I think you have to have at least some innate ability to sell. Um, and a lot of curiosity and, and um, I think wherewithal is you know, really important because you're going to come up. You're going to encounter just so many challenges you can't even imagine. I think, the, you know, perseverance and curiosity come up a lot in these discussions. Yeah. It's interesting. It's, uh, I think all the ones you said are true, but you have to persevere. And if you're not curious, it's because the problems are so much deeper and harder. Yeah. That you, you, like you keep pulling a string and you find out kind of where it takes you. And yeah. If, if you're not engaged, the terrain you got to navigate to get through it is too hard. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're, those, those two things are a little bit in conflict, right? Because you have to be steadfast in what it is that you're doing, but you have to be curious enough to explore different ways to get there um, without pivoting so far out of that rut or so far out of that, that track that you end up on something that is just not even something that you're passionate enough about to, to move forward with. It's funny. My dad, who's an entrepreneur, used, used the phrase way before um, this era, but it was he talked about, he said, great entrepreneurs have what he calls fuzzy vision. And it, uh, he said, imagine you're, uh, you know, past the airport driving towards the bought by Schomburg, by the IKEA, where we officially buy all our startup furniture. Um, so you're driving down um, the highway, and you can see the Sears Tower, and you see the shape of it. And you can see it; it's clear on the skyline where it is, what it is. But you can't describe it in great detail. But you know that's what I'm, that's where I'm going. Yeah. And as you get by O'Hare, you start to get a little clearer. It's got the two, two uh, antennas on top, and it looks like it's got a little bit of a jut out. And you get to the junction, you can see a little more. You could get, as you get off the highway, you can start to see, you get closer to the architectural effects. The whole time it's the same building, and you recognize it as the same building you saw way out in Schaumburg. But the difference is, is that your ability to sort of look at it and identify its specificity is only as you get further along. Yeah. And his comment was, people have specific vision, meaning they can't see it from out there, but they decide to describe it anyway, end up rarely finding what they're looking for because they're not... They're, they're sort of jumping the gun on it. Yeah. And instead saying, here's what I know about it, and here and then figuring out the rest. Yeah, yeah. Um, he said, that's what they look like. The great entrepreneur will say, yes, that is exactly what I was always going for, but I never could have described it this way because I didn't know it had all these elements to it. Yeah, yeah. And that paradox, I think, kind of gets that persistence. I'm going at that with the flexibility to say, well, i, I got to keep learning and keep 
figuring yep. out how it really is. And how it, it works. That lends to something else that we've learned, which is just that trying to plan too far ahead um, or be too specific with your plans um, is usually a waste of time in a startup because, uh, like you said, know what the building looks like, head for it, but um, trying to plan exactly how you're going to get there before you even know what traffic's like or anything like that um, is, is futile. Spend that time and that effort on something that's more productive. Well, it's funny, you know, this, this friend of mine who I went to college with heard this story, and she's probably in her early 30s at the time, and she said it's great career advice, but she worked at a bank. And I said, why is that great career advice for a banker? She was a woman who went to college on a scholarship, and she worked really hard, and she was really proud of what she did. She got a job at a really great bank and in their best program, and she was always like hardworking, like I'm always going to overachieve, right? I'm going to achieve, achieve, achieve. And her goal when she was in college was, I want to be a senior vice president of a bank, by, of a money center bank by the time I'm in my early 30s. And she got there. Tell you what, 26, 27, she was head of investor relations for a major bank. I mean, she, she was a hot shot. And she got there and she nailed it and God bless her, she really pulled it off exactly what she said. And she got there and she said, this isn't that great. Yeah. I don't really like this. And what happened is she had such a specific vision of what she wanted to do without having seen all the other things that came yeah. that she had blinders on and didn't take the other forks in the road that had she applied herself, she might have found something she was more passionate yep. and more fulfilled, fulfilled doing. And I, it's funny to think of the same advice that's great for an entrepreneur a founder would be helpful to someone who takes such a different path, yeah. but it's really good life advice, I think. Yeah, well, it, it's a great way to build, to, to solve a problem that's not there anymore by the time you solve it, right? Mm -hmm. You're so focused on that problem without watching what's going on around you and adjusting that by the time you're finished and you're ready to launch, let's say, nobody has that problem anymore. Well, and you don't realize, I think, what um, the assumptions you're making. It's one of the things benefit about things like Lean Startup is what are the assumptions you're making? If you, if you state your assumptions, you realize that that's the case. We talk a lot at, at, at Max and at Sison, we talk a lot about um, Google says, what do you know and what do you think? And they ask you the question, do you think, do we think that or do we know that? <clears throat> and knowing it means we have evidence. Thinking it um, means we don't. And the fact is, is m the average person mistakes thinking and knowing. Because if I think it, I feel like I know it. Yeah. But knowing it means there's objective evidence. Like we have something that, that proves it, right? But we all, it's, it's a human fallacy, a human tendency to think, well, I think it, therefore, it must be true because I have such conviction about it. Yeah. And as a founder, you get that because you start to believe your vision and your specific plan so much yeah. that, you know, you, you start to, it, it's hard to not let go and say, but it's true. I just, those customers are wrong. Yeah. You know, they don't know. And, and it's tough because you have to, early on especially, you have to rely on your gut sometimes and, and you get that muscle memory. But at some point, you have to take the, the data the feedback that you're getting, all those sorts of things, and figure out how to mesh the two yeah. um, to, to, to get where you really need to be. It's like vision and plan are two different things. Yeah. Your vision is directional and your plan is specific, and the yeah, plan's yeah. got to evolve, but you still got your true north. Yeah, great way to describe it. Um, well, it's good. So another question was, and I, by the way, I'm not logged in as a moderator. Usually I'm logged in. They logged me in tonight as um, not as a moderator, so I would do my best to go through your questions, but I don't have the same capability as usual. Um, so here's a bizarre one. Um, what should Chewy Garcia have done differently in social media? Oh, good question. Um, Not exactly a startup question, but we'll go with it anyway. Yeah, uh, I don't know enough about what he did do um, to be able to answer that, really. I think that, um, uh, look, elections, national or local, can be won with social media. I think that you're seeing it with Hillary now. You saw it with, with both of the candidates last time around. Um, the, uh, they're assembling these big data-centric teams of people who are experts at online marketing and social media and all these things, um, that can, I'm convinced that that can win elections at this point. Um, so uh, certainly could have spent a little more money there um, and maybe had a different outcome. But in terms of tactical, I, I just don't know enough to answer that. Okay. Uh, how do you balance family life while building a company? Whew, I don't know. Um, so uh, I have a six-month-old at home. Um, uh, she's awesome. I've started leaving the office at a normal time. Uh, it's always been, so first of all, um, my wife Elizabeth gets, gets all the credit in us being able to balance this because she's never once complained. She's just awesome. And look, I mean, you're doing 80, 90 hour weeks early on and, and that, doesn't, that doesn't go away for quite a while. So um, having someone who's very supportive and um, uh, by
buys into the whole idea. I mean, I was making good money. I quit my job and said, hey, by the way, I'm going to go start this thing that may fail. Um, but she was awesome. So, you know, in, in terms of balance, I think you've got to have time car carved out. I think everyone will tell you that. There has to be some, some uh, sacred time that, that you just don't mess with. For me now, it's going to put my daughter to bed and, and hanging out. We eat together, and, and then I go back to work. But um, I don't think there is such a thing as real balance. It's just you have to find some level that everyone around you can live with, and, and hopefully your, your business still gets enough of your attention. Yeah, it's interesting. The other thing is you don't find a lot of entrepreneurs who are golfers. Yeah, <laughs> not at all. You've got you to prioritize. You've got to prioritize your family. And, and uh, Yeah, I had to wait four family. years into Game of Thrones to watch it until I actually had some time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I got there on flights. Mm -hmm. That was my secret on flights. Um, Although that's not a good one to watch on flights if there are people of varying ages around you. You kind of yeah, have to yeah. cover the screen because yeah. it's a little embarrassing. People think you're watching something a little different than you are. Yeah. Um, how do you open up new markets, especially with a change of language, culture, communication barriers, learning, learning yeah. the language, dealing with the culture, and, and how do you? Yeah, so um, Jason Fried at 37 Signals told me something early on. He said, don't localize unless you plan to also staff in whatever that language is. So. Um, just localizing the product isn't enough, although that's, that's challenging in and of itself. Um, our approach, and you know, it's, it's yet to be seen how successful we are with this, was um, hire locally. We wanted people who could be part of our culture. Um, we were able to find people with, with Spanish and Portuguese as well as English um, uh, who were, were excellent at, at, at all these languages who could join us here in Chicago and be part of the team, um, and then go back and sell into the markets. Now, I think the key is you have to pick markets that are are, have a high likelihood of success. So for us, that means a lot of social media usage, high adoption, high growth. Um, uh, some, you know, that, that de-risks a little of the, uh, the, the, the risk that's usually associated with going to new markets. You don't know how they do business. You don't know how they do those things. Um, we also looked at markets where we already had a good amount of customers who were just tolerating the fact that we were in English because we were the best thing available. So we said, where are the customers who are coming in with different browser languages and those sorts of things where we think we can make the most hay? So de-risk it a little bit. The next couple will, will tell us more. Um, and then, you know, I think there are a lot of markets that aren't too dissimilar from the US and, and Europe. Um, when you start to get into some of the Asian markets or, or, or uh, Germany and Russia, for example, those are going to be very different. You've got to learn all of the um, how they do business. And, and in a lot of cases, you've got to have people on the ground there. Um, we're not going into those markets initially, so we think that the um, success rate should be a little higher. Got it. Um, how does having investors complicate the development of your original vision? Does it help or hinder your vision? Um, it can be helpful. I would say more often than not, though, it, it hinders. Um, I, I think that you find people um, who will walk into a board meeting and, and take a lot of input um, and maybe give some of it a little too much, um, a little too much attention and you can start to get away from your original idea. And that goes for investors, advisors, people on the street giving you advice. If you listen too much to it without a good filter, you can get off track. Um, uh, with, with our investors, we established early on, one of the conversation was, you guys are great at product. If we ever try and tell you about product, tell us to shut up. Um, and, and that's how it went. Uh, when when they, they asked questions about product, we said, remember guys, we're the experts on the product. Um, let's talk about the business plan, about the strategy, et cetera. Got it. Uh, social media is evolving all the time. Seems like there's a lot of new social media platforms out there. How do you decide which platforms to support? Yeah, good question. So we're working on Instagram now. Um, the, uh, the way that we decide the, the, the platforms that are worth our time, uh, there's a couple criteria we look for. So the first is customer demand. It has to be there. That starts with consumer demand. Our customers don't want to, uh, to be on a platform until there's a bunch of consumers there. Once we have the customer demand, then the next thing we look for is that whoever the network is, so let's say it's Pinterest or Instagram or, or whoever the, the network is, they have to have enough resources behind their APIs and the data layer of their business that we feel like we can give a reliable experience to our customers. Um, and that usually happens just organically as the network grows. Uh, Instagram got big enough that now they have a robust API that we can tap into. So we look for the demand. But then also, is it a product that we're comfortable that we can give our customers a world-class experience with, that it's not going to break all the time, that it's well-documented, those sorts of things. Great. Um, are you profitable now? We're not. Um, we're, we're, we spend about 15 cents to make a dollar. Um, and we're going to keep doing that uh, for uh, the foreseeable future. We 
Um, our payback on our um, customer acquisition investment is um, outstanding. Um, so we're not optimizing for profitability at this point. Uh, the good news is our organization is very efficient. Um, and we have the option of profitability in pretty short order if that was a priority for us. It just isn't right now. And do you think, is this, is this something, I mean, it seems like a huge market. You're obviously doing a great job. Could this be a billion dollar company? Easily, yeah. I, um, the, 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 the working plan is we'll be a $2 billion company within about 48 months. Sorry, say that again? Two billion in about 48 months. Two billion in 48 months, yeah. wow. That's incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, I gotta uh, let that sink in for a minute. Yeah. It, it, it took us a while into our life before you start to be able to conceptualize that kind of growth and be able to see the path to get there. And the chess pieces get bigger and bigger, but once you're able to zoom out to that level and say, yeah, we can get there, here's exactly how we're gonna do it, and, and a bunch of logical people can sit around a table and believe it, um, that's really interesting. That's really, that's exciting, it's exciting. So, um, a couple questions we do at the end always. Um, first one is, if you had to do it over again, if you're, not even this, if you, if you were an entrepreneur all over again, what's some, is there something you'd say, boy, I'd always do this again? Yeah. What would that be? Um, so, uh, I, I can't say again because we didn't do it early on, but I can say I would always do this from now on, which is just um, not be shy, not being shy about growing faster. Hire faster, um, uh, spend money faster, do things. Talk about why I think it's helpful for uh, founders aspiring to do this. Put yourself in the shoes of why you chose not to do that then. Yeah. And then advise your, your, your old self what looks different on this side, yeah. understanding their perspective. Because I think it's, it's easy for someone in the audience to hear and say, well, it's easy to say that now you're going to be a $2 billion company yeah, in 48 yeah. months, right? Yep. Like you, you know, but when you're sitting there, obviously it wasn't intuitive yeah. back when you were in the, that seat. Yeah. So help, help us understand the person, you know, what, 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 what feels different here than now when you're on the other side. Yeah. When, so when you're in that situation, right, where, where let's call it six months in after funding in the, initial, in the initial case, where we actually had some money to spend, and that's all your chips. This is the only thing you have, and you don't know if the next round of funding is going to come. You don't know if people are going to start buying your product in ways that they're not yet. Um, that's a hard thing to get past mentally. Um, and, and to be honest, and I'm going to contradict myself a little bit here, but that first year, had we spent faster, um, in our particular case, because we needed to rebuild that software, we might not have made it out of that phase. Once we had market fit, product market fit, that's the point when I think you step on the gas in a bigger way. We were coming off of a very lean year of just a lot of um, uh, you know, what ifs and, and are we gonna make it? And that's difficult to, to just jettison right away and start putting the Psychology on the gas. of it. Totally. So, you're, so you just kind of have the, the residual psychology of yeah. being lean and trying to stay yeah, yeah. afloat. Interesting. Good advice. Um, but wait till you hit that product market fit inflection yeah. curve. Yeah. And, and you have to know, um, you have to know that that next dollar you spend is going to be good. In other words, you have to know your customer acquisition model. Um, it's a lot of people will say, well, we've, we've acquired X number of customers and we haven't even marketed or advertised yet. That, that is not a, a, a good proof point. You need to understand when you do start advertising, because you're going to have to at some point, what does that customer cost you? And if you can understand that, when you can prove out that economic model and you know that it's, it's green, um, that's the point when you need to step on the gas in a bigger way than we did initially. And were your investors pushing you to do it? All the time. All the time. Even today, I, I probably double my expenses before I send over the board deck. And, <laughs> no. Um, no, they always want us to spend more money, um, and, and rightfully so. We... We've always been very pragmatic, and we, we, we look for the right places to spend money. And if they don't exist, we won't do it. Um, but yeah, that, that pressure, you know, and, and over the years, we've gotten fallen more on their side of the fence, and we want to spend more money and find places to invest. But if you don't see them, if, if the opportunities aren't there, you have to know when to, OK, let's, let's uh, you know, if you use a, a gambling analogy, let's, let's take the bet off for a little while. Let's find the next opportunity, and now let's put double back to work, and it's, it's, you're constantly doing that. Uh, well, sounds like you're doing it really well. Uh, exciting, exciting chapter ahead. As you, as you think about having started your business in Chicago, seeing what's happening here at 1871, seeing what's happening in our community, 
as a startup community. Um, what's your view on Chicago for entrepreneurs? What do you think is the good and what do you think is the challenging? Yeah, so um, I think that uh, we're in a good place right now. I think that two or three years ago, it was a little dicey. Um, six years ago, there wasn't a lot going on and I, I think that we've come a tremendous way. But I think that um, we're in a position now where we've had enough success. You've got um, Grubhub and Groupon and companies like this that, um, and, and some that nobody ever talks about that are just hitting it out of the park that are crazy. Um, we have enough success now. People are a little more grounded than they were a few years ago. A few years ago, there was a lot of early stage stuff happening that didn't necessarily have um, any kind of potential for escape velocity, but I, I don't think we're doing as much of that now. So we've, we've absolutely got the talent here. When you start getting into really specialized technical talent or SaaS talent, it gets a little harder here, but most people don't need that right away. Um, we've got the talent, the money's here now. There's a lot more people putting money into, in, into startups here in Chicago. Um, the, there's, there's enough of a, we'll call it a, a, a knowledge network. People have been there and done that. People like you who have, have built companies here who we can look to and, and ask questions. There's enough um, uh, uh, memory uh, of having been there and done that now built up that it's kind of critical mass that, that everyone can, can, can lean on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have that going for us. So I think there was a little bit of a hype. Um, I think we're, we're back down to a really solid place right now. Good. Um, anything that you would give you, that you would say if you're a Chicago entrepreneur, you'd be wary of a blind spot or anything that? Good question. Um, I think that uh, you have to be tough to, to you have to be careful of competing with anything that's that's got a head start in the valley. Um, if you're building a you know a delivery app or or something like that that um, already has uh, a market leader in Chicago, that's going to be tough ground to make up. It's not impossible. People have done it, um, but I would I would strive for um, unique ideas or at least a different spin um, mm -hmm. on a better mousetrap because we are so far outside of the kind of the bubble of the valley. Well, it's good advice. You saw that with Sitter City, which has been a great company, but. You know, um, our friend Peter Barris at NEA, were, they were, I think, spending $50 million on marketing on their 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 version. And, you know, you, when you're getting outspent two, three, four to one, yep. it's hard to hard to win that arms race. Totally. Um, great advice. And as you look out at these young entrepreneurial companies out there, um, what advice would you have for them as they're looking to sort of um, figure out, is this my Sprout Social? Wow. Um I think if you can convince a room full of smart people, and it could be three or four, um, that the thing that you want to do is really interesting and exciting and they'll show up every day and work on it, I think that's enough to tell you that it's got the potential. I think at some point you've got to size your market and do those things and realize how big can it really be. Um, but I mean, we've got enough smart people around us now. We should be gut checking these ideas. Um, and look, if you're passionate about it and you've got the talent around you and people who are excited enough to do it, just try it. The, the, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to learn a lot. Um, and then, you know, if, if uh, th there's nothing unique about Chicago that should hold anyone back. It, that just doesn't exist anymore. We've got the investment dollars, the talent, and everything else. So, you know, um, I, I hate to see people spending a lot of time on ideas that, that they've never got past their friends and family who are only going to tell them nice things. Um, but if you know if you can catch people in the halls here at 1871 and convince people it's a good idea, then I you know I think you've got as good a shot as we ever did. Well, you're building a great company. You're a great leader here in our community. Thank you for sharing it tonight. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. All.